your lunch break. I hope you all are having a great conference. My name is Pamela Melton. I'm a reference librarian at the University of South Carolina School of Law. Um, I'm, I teach legal research, advanced and basic legal research. I do not have an education background. I don't even really have a technology background. Um, and so I'm going to share with you some of my, what I hope will be practical tips and I hope we'll get some input from you as well. And with me is Um, hi, I am Corinne G. Can you all hear me? Good. Um, I am the manager of research services at Wilmer, Cutler, and Pick Pickering, one of the largest law firms in D.C. And my career has come full circle. Um, having followed my husband due to a transfer, I find myself back in law firm librarianship. But previously, uh, I was a librarian relations consultant for Lexis for five years. So I know several of you out in the audience. And before that, I worked at uh, USC, and that would be University of Southern California, as the opposed to the other one. Uh, I worked at University of Texas at Austin. Uh, I worked at uh, LA County Law Library for a while. I was a law firm librarian in Los Angeles, and I started my career as a children's librarian, so I'm pretty much a mutt. Um, but I, I love game shows, so hopefully uh, our enthusiasm will, will show during this program. OK. I've, I've talked to a lot of people, and um, there's a little bit of resistance to using games in the classroom, or maybe a reluctance, uh, a feeling that you can't justify um, in a serious academic setting, like we all work in, or a serious law firm setting, can't justify using games. It seems to be something um, sort of frivolous about them, and so there's a little bit of reluctance. But actually, there's some quite good pedagogical reasons for using games. Um, games encourage people to sustain their interest. Now, this may come as a surprise to you, but legal research is boring to law students. No matter what you do, it's boring. And so anything that we can do to help sustain that interest is welcome. So you do these, whatever format you do, your class in, you lecture, and you take them into the lab and the library and all this, but the games provide a welcome break from, from the things that pretty much feel like the other things that they're doing in law school. I worried the first time I, I used something that was slightly non-serious in my classroom that graduate students would be offended and they would feel um, talked down to, for example. When I was grading my first set of papers, I had a, a few of them who got everything right or got almost everything right. So they got 100% or 99. And when I was grading them, I just drew little smiley faces on the top. I don't know why I did it. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't come from an ele elementary school background. I wasn't into giving stickers, you know, and all this kind of stuff. I don't know why I did it. But I just, on the papers that were perfect or nearly perfect, I put little smiley faces. And then I went and handed them out. I put them in everybody's box. And I thought, oh, no, now they're going to think that, you know, I think they're fourth graders. And I was leaving the law school one night and a student was coming in to put in his hours in the library and he stopped me and he said, I got my paper out of my box today and he said, that happy face just made my day. <laughs> so, you know, they, they're so, um, there's so much pressure on them and everything is so serious that I don't think there's anything wrong with adding something like that, something personal, something that they could take as an attaboy, you know, they don't get too many of those. Um, and that brings us to the third point, that games can lower anxiety. And, and if you're anxious, we're going to talk about this a little bit further, but if you're anxious, you're just not going to learn as much. 
And then they're highly motivating. Games are highly motivating because they're amusing and because they're interesting. And we got to keep them motivated. I know at our law school, the curriculum itself does not provide our students with much motivation to put a lot of time into legal research. It's a one-hour class. It lasts 12 weeks. And that may be more than, than people get at other law schools, but it isn't compared to their three-hour torts and their three-hour criminal law and three-hour contracts and all that, four hours of constitutional law. It just isn't enough in and of itself to keep them motivated. So anything you can do to make your class different or exciting or fun, make it a break, make it someplace they love to come to, huh, um, if that were possible, um, and games can help do that. Now, how to choose a game? And we're talking about television game shows, and we'll talk about that later. But um, a game has to be more than just fun. And we've already acknowledged that games are good because they're fun. But there has to be something more to it for you to devote your valuable classroom time to a game. And there are some good um, in the educational literature, and I've already confessed to you that I don't have an educational background, so I don't know education speak, but I learned some of it. There's um, a concept called an effective filter, affective, A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E, -E, and some of you may know what that is. It's an imaginary wall that is between the student and what they want to learn, and the filter turns on when anxiety is high or when self-esteem is low, and believe me, if anything can lower your self-esteem, law school can do that. Um, and where motivation is low. And we've already talked about how there's not a whole lot of motivation built into the system when it comes to primarily legal research. Now, you, some of you all may be teaching other things, but I, that's where I come from. So um, anything that you're teaching um, where you can make the students more receptive, that's worth doing. They absorb more when this effective filter has been removed, and the games help to do that. Um, they also promote um, good cognitive um, skills. They reinforce things that you've been trying to teach them in a way that's different, so it helps them um, make that a permanent part of their learning. And it, it's a way to review and extend what you're doing. Um, I think games should involve friendly competition, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we consider how to, the games that are possible to choose, um, there's going to be competition, and Lord knows there's competition in law school and the other classes, but I think in these games that we choose, it ought to be friendly. You know, the stakes ought to be low, and there ought not to be anything um, dreadful about um, participating in the game. Um, you should keep all of the students involved and interested. You should choose games where you don't have one or two players and everybody else is a spectator. If possible, you ought to choose a game that everybody can be a part of, even if they're not at any one point a part. There's a possibility at any point that they would be called on to be part of the game. So that's a, a thing to keep in mind when you're choosing games. And um, it should give the students a chance to either learn something new, practice what they've learned, or as a review of their material. Finally, the game should be adaptable. And by that, I mean you need to be able to revise the content. You need to make it more difficult, less difficult, depending on the group that you're talking about. Um, it should require a minimum of preparation after you develop it. Now, the things that we're going to talk about, may, they, they might be pretty intense at the front end. But after you get the initial work done, it should be easy to adapt them. When to use games? Well, um, there are lots of times when it might be appropriate to use games. Um, I use a game at the very first class that I meet with my students. I have a set of little puzzles, picture puzzles, um, about 60 pieces each, Pokemon puzzles. I've been trying to find something a little more up to date. I mean, Pokemon is about 15 minutes ago. But anyway, um, it's got just enough pieces, and I divide my classes, which are fairly small. I teach um, groups of 10 to 12. I teach a lot during the week, but I, I keep the groups themselves small. And I divide them up into smaller, even smaller groups, and I give each of them a puzzle, and I tell them I'm going to time them, and then I say go, and they have to put the puzzles together. And um, then I make note of which group gets finished first and how long it took them. And then we go back and we talk about what their strategy was for putting the puzzle together. 
And some of them, there's clearly a leader in the group. Somebody takes charge and says, okay, you do the outside and you do this and you do that. Some of them don't have a leader, but they all seem to agree on how to approach it, whether you do the straight edges first or whether you go for the pictures and put those things together. But they all have a strategy. And I sort of remind them that however long it took them and whatever strategy they used, they all put their puzzles together. And this is to help them get started thinking about legal research as a process, not as a series of discrete things, sources and things that you learn about, but as a process and how different strategies may work for different situations and how ultimately the goal of all the strategies is to get the puzzle put together. And so I use that in my very first class. Now, I don't use a game in every class because you've got too much to cover and you can't always use a game, but I do try to do something fun in every class. Um, but that's an intro. It's a way to break the ice, to help them get used to me and help me to see what their dynamics are in their group and that kind of thing. And then you can use games at the end of class to reinforce what you've done that day, either at the end of a single class or at the end of a, of a semester, because games do lend themselves to revision, um, to review exercises, helping them recall what they should have learned over the semester in a way that um, is less stressful than a, an outright exam. And, that, and that's the way that I use my game, the one that I'm going to show you, is um, to do my final review. I have all of my classes meet together in a big room, and then they sit in their legal research sections, but we do the review all together. Now, why TV game shows in particular? There, there are lots and lots of games that you can use, but I think there are some com pretty good reasons for using team uh, TV game shows, and one of them is that our students are, are raised watching TV. It's just a sort of a natural activity. It takes place without their even thinking about it a lot of times. Um, the TV games are instantly recognizable. Um, they don't have to be told the rules because most of the rules are well known. You may adapt the rules um, a little bit for your particular situation, but in gen the general framework of the rules will already be known and it'll be easy to adapt them to your particular needs. Um, TV games are visually oriented, and that engages everybody, and um, we all know how important visual learning is, so the, t the TV game shows seem to fit well in that um, mode. And we do it because we can. We can virtually replicate them, or we can get pretty close. We can get close enough so that everybody is, um, is engaged and recognizes what we're doing. All right, well, if we're going to use a TV game show, what are some of the possibilities? Well, one of them is Survivor. And Corinne has got a version of Survivor that she's, I hope we're going to have time for her to talk about because it sounds really cool. Now, I decided that the format was too hard to adapt because it was a game where basically everybody would have to be doing the same thing at the same time and you would eliminate the people who did it wrong. But some of you may have, um, have used this game, and Corinne has, has worked out that problem really well, so I hope she'll get to tell you about it. By the way, I meant to do this at the beginning. How many of you already use a game show in your classes? Okay. Well, please don't let me be a talking head up here. I'm, I'm hoping to learn from you all as much as, as maybe you all can learn something from me. So if you have a comment, we hopefully we'll have time for comments, but if you want to say something as we're going through, please feel free to do so. Okay, another possibility would be the $64,000 question. Well, that one's probably too old. That's not on now, and people don't really know the rules. And it, you could, it, it has the possibility of using lots of information, and you can call on people one at a time maybe and do it. But for my purposes, people just aren't familiar enough with it. The $20,000 pyramid. Now, I'm probably revealing my age because I know about all these game shows. But anyway, um, that's another one where I don't think, I think the format of the game show limits the amount of material that you can cover. But it's a possibility. I and mean, you might be able, like um, Corinne did with Survivor, if you're smarter than I am, you might be able to figure out a way to use it. But it's there. Um, Hollywood Squares. I've seen game shows done based on Hollywood Squares. That seems to me to be another one where you don't have enough participants. You know, you've got your grid of squares up there answering questions, and then everybody else maybe is a, a, um, an observer, and that's not really what I wanted to do with mine. Family Feud has some possibilities. You could divide them into teams and, and have them ask, you know, answer the question and have the answer pop up, and 
that, um, once again, I think though that may be a little too old. Unless they're watching Nick at Night or one of those channels, they probably are not going to be all that familiar with Family Feud. There's Wheel of Fortune. I've seen a game, not a legal research game or a law school game based on this, but there have been adaptations of Wheel of Fortune for the classroom, and it might work well for some formats, but I just didn't think it would work for me. Now, here's my current favorite game show that I like to watch. Whose line is it anyway? I mean, you could ask people questions, and they could make up answers, but that seemed a little too hard to control, that format. You give a little over, too much control over to the, to the students. So for me, that wasn't the one I chose. The weakest link. Now, that's the one where you can ask lots of questions, but my bottom line on that one was it was too mean. And we talked about the... We talked about keeping the competition friendly, and that one just lends itself to um, you don't want to have them coming out of the classroom feeling like they've been sawed off at the knees. That happens in some other classrooms in our law school, so I don't want them to have that feeling in mind. Who wants to be a millionaire is a great choice, and I'm not going to talk much about it because Corinne has a wonderful adaptation that she's done, and she's going to talk about it. But... For my purposes, my winner was Jeopardy, and Jeopardy is probably the most common choice for people who do game shows. Um, it's almost 20 years old. Probably there are law students who can't remember when Jeopardy wasn't on TV. Um, in, 19, in 2001, they had their 4,000th episode. So Jeopardy has just been going on forever and ever. And I think that's a tribute to the format. I think it's a very successful format. Um, but here are, the, here are my main reasons for using this. It's student-centered. The student gets to choose the category and the value, and, and they really take control of the game. And that, I think that's a, a valuable thing to have going on in the class. The, the corollary to that is that the teacher just sort of runs the mechanics of the game, and mediates any disputes if they think they're answering at the same time. You get to say who got it. Um, in my class, um, it builds class cohesion. In my class, I have them sit in their small legal research sections, and they have um, a designated person. They can consult with each other about the answer, but there's a designated person who's supposed to give the answer. Um, but it fosters the whole class participation because everybody has to be alert for the opportunity to steal the board away from another class. So um, I'll explain how we work ours when, when I get to showing you my game. Um, I think this promotes a healthy kind of competition. You've got to keep it light. You've got to keep it fun. Um, it's not cutthroat. It should never be cutthroat. Um, everybody should feel free to venture a guess if they don't know it. They should feel free to laugh at themselves. Um, it uses lots of information. I mean, the Jeopardy board is just ideal for setting up with the six categories and the five value levels and double Jeopardy and final Jeopardy. I mean, you can just, I, I have on occasion had to scrape the bottom of the barrel to come up with enough questions to fill up the board. So it's, uh, and you can have um, daily doubles where you sort of multiply the effect of one question into various categories. So Jeopardy, for my purposes, allows me to cover almost everything that they really need to know when they finish their legal research class. And finally, it's easily adapted to any level, to any subject. Um, you can go in and change one category or change all the categories. Once you get the basic game built, you can change any of the questions. It's just really, um, I think it's, it, it's my favorite one. And I can tell by all the heads nodding out there, it's, it's your favorite one too. Or, a lot of people have it as their favorite. Well, now I'm going to show you some Jeopardy variations. You don't have to, I know this is the conference on law school computing, and um, there are probably some very sophisticated solutions to this problem, but I wanted to offer a range because not everybody has the time or the facilities to do the high-end solutions, so I'm going to show you some low-tech versions. The very first thing that I did was as low-tech as it could possibly be. I just went into my classroom before well before the class, and I drew the Jeopardy board on the blackboard, and I drew the categories and wrote in the values, and then when I, I called on people and they got to pick a category and a value, and when they'd answered the question, I erased the value. And we didn't have double Jeopardy. We just went once through it, 
and it was hardly, I mean, I didn't even bother to do the answer and then question format. It was Jeopardy and name only. It was just a way to get, to make the review look a little more interesting. Um, there's a slightly higher tech version, but still low enough tech so that most people could do it. And I have to confess, I got this idea at a colloquium on um, legal research and writing here at Duke a month ago, and this was, uh, somebody had, had found this as a, a wedding shower game. This was Wedding Shower Jeopardy, and she adapted it to legal writing. And <laughs> <laughs> so we got cases, statutes, regulations, secondary authority, sites, and grab bag, which is, you know, just anything I couldn't fit into. I didn't have enough values to fit into the other categories. Each of these is a pocket. I just taped them on, and the questions are on a card. And when you, when somebody chooses a category, you pull out the card, you read the answer, and when they've done, you throw it down, and you know not to go back to that because there's no card there. It's really simple. Once you get the thing done, you could, you can swap out any of the categories. Um, it took me a couple hours one night while I was watching the baseball games and um, College World Series. And um, it's not hard to do. You can do it, you know, any color you want to. I chose blue and white because that's like the Jeopardy board, but um, it's a really low-tech solution if you don't have um, in your classroom, and I know a lot of places don't have classrooms set up so that you could use technology, but um, it's a little bit different, and your class might think it's fun. Okay, there are medium, there's a medium-tech version that Corinne did that involved using overhead transparencies, and if you don't mind, I'll just go ahead and describe it. Because she did the Jeopardy board and made a transparency of it and just put it on the overhead projector and projected it on the wall and the students chose the category and the value and then she swapped out the Jeopardy board with a transparency that had that question on it. And um, so it was really, once you got your, your transparencies made, it's maybe a little bit more work, definitely a little bit more work for the instructor than this one would be, but it does utilize some technology. So if you have overheads but not um, a way to project a computer screen on the board, you might think of that as an option. And finally, we got some higher tech versions. Um, there's a PowerPoint-based, I found a PowerPoint-based um, Jeopardy for the classroom game on a website. And I had it downloaded and I went back to the website and there was this big sign on the website saying that all these games, Jeopardy, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, Hollywood Squares, and The Weakest Link, had been removed at the request of the Sony Corporation. <laughs> and they had the music and everything. But this Jeopardy was a PowerPoint presentation and you could down, I downloaded it, so I have it. Um, and... <laughs> I have it and you don't, but you can get it. I would email it to you. Anybody who wants it, I'd be glad to email it to you. I mean, we're not making money off of this, so I think we're we're okay. Fair use, yes, we're we're good. we're good. But you could um, you'll see when when Corinne talks about her who wants to be a, a millionaire game that PowerPoint works for this kind of thing too. But I did an HTML version. I know there's at least one other HTML version user, Jeopardy user in the classroom. And um, I worked on this several years in a row. Um, and I know all of you high tech types are going to fall out of your seats laughing. This is what my HTML coding looks like. I mean, it's just about as simple as it can get. This is one of my um, answer pages, one of my, or question pages. Um, you don't have to do anything really complicated. Um, I mean, you can make it as complicated as you like. I don't really have a technology background. I've learned how to do some things. But um, if you have the capability to make a really high-tech Jeopardy game, you are certainly um, ahead of me. All right, here's what my Jeopardy game looks like. Load. There we go. I have all of the categories and I have the values and the values are all links that take us to the question as in the form of an answer and then it takes us to the answer in the form of a question and then it takes us back to the board so we can continue playing. Now I, 
I did this first with regular links um, on a, a grid that didn't have a colored background. And so when I did it before, when I came back to the board, the link that I had just used was grayed out so I could tell where I had been. Um, I haven't figured out this because I wanted to make the backboard, background look like Jeopardy, and so I made the font a color that stays. So I'll figure that out. I'm continually working on this. If any of you know how to do it, please tell me before I leave. Okay. I've got a couple of daily doubles. One daily double hidden in here, and then we go from here to Double Jeopardy. And I've got a whole new set of categories, increased values. I've got two daily doubles hidden in here. Um, and I had some music embedded so that when my screen opened up, you could hear the intro to the Jeopardy game, the opening music, which I got from this um, website that's no longer offering it. Um, but you know how, how things are. I accidentally, accidentally deleted the file from my disk. So I'll have to, I have it on my hard drive, so I'll have to redo that. But anyway, it's pretty cool to have it come up and you hear the Jeopardy music gets everybody going. I have final Jeopardy music and I have the little questions, dings, and all that. Um, so you can make it look pretty much like, um, like your um, regular Jeopardy board. And it's very easy to change the categories, change the questions. You just go back in and edit your little HTML page. Um, is that basically, can I call on you in the audience, Deborah? Is that basically um, the way you do yours? Yeah, mine's very similar. Um, I have to admit that I didn't do the coding. I had someone who did the coding <laughs> to help me out with it. So um, it's basically the same thing. Um, it's just that I Well, I, the first time I did it, I did, I did use the back thing because I didn't have the answers. But once you get to back, then you have to go. I, I wanted to go directly back to the board, and that's why I put the button in there. Yeah. I see how you do the daily double. Oh, let's see if I can figure out where it is. Yeah. There, 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 there. It's just, yeah. <laughs> well, when you click, you click on that, and then you get the first one, and then when you go to the answer for the first one, you get the second one. And that's not exactly how the daily double works, but that's what I use it for, to double my value, my question value. You know, I get actually two questions for one there. Um, I have each class has a scorekeeper assigned. Oh, and the other thing about this, that I learned when I did this, found out about this game, I couldn't figure out how to get a signal from the classes as to who was going next. And the, the girl who showed me this, the woman who showed me this, says she uses squeaky toys, like a dog toy with a noise in it, and they just bang them on the desk. You know, squeaky, squeaky, squeaky. Or, you know. <laughs> I thought that was great, and I couldn't find any. We threw away, my dog doesn't play with those. They have to be um, you know, stuffed animals that it can rip the insides out of. So I don't have any squeaky toys, and my kids are too old. We, we searched the house yesterday, and they don't have toys. I mean, they have toys that make noise, but none that they would lend me. I mean, they're all like, you know, Panasonic eWare video recorders, but they won't lend them to me for my class. So um, anyway, um, that's how I did that. Um, yeah. A different sound, right. <laughs> and law students will fight over anything. They will. So, well, I, since I didn't have a way to have them sort of buzz in, I, what I did was I started my first class and I let them choose a category and a value. And then I allowed them to continue down until they got one wrong, until they ran a category or they got one wrong. When they got one wrong, the floor was open and the first class that raised their hand with the right answer got to take over. And then they could keep the board until they got one wrong or they ran a category. That way one class last year, I'm telling you, I had this student who had a notebook, a legal research notebook that was this big. And she was sitting over here, and every question that came up, she had the answer. I mean, she was, she was, she could have run the board. If I had let her, she would have run the entire two boards without getting anything wrong. And everybody was going, what is wrong with you? I mean, this is legal research for Pete's sake. I mean, we don't even take this seriously. She's over there flipping her notebook. Anyway, that's the way I did it, but I'm going to try the squeaky toys. Yeah. <laughs> there, 
they're there. Actually, I I did download the the Think music, the dee 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 dee, which I used last year, and I think I did get it off of that site. Um, and I just haven't gone back, but that's a great idea because there is a Jeopardy.com website where all of this is, where you can actually go in and play Jeopardy if you don't have anything else to do. That's right. That is exactly right. Now, I, I try to keep my classes small so that people will feel like they can talk, but I have to tell you, they don't talk very often until we do this review. And then they're talking together over each other at the top of their voices, so you're absolutely right. You have to set some ground rules very clearly at the beginning, and it probably would help me this time to have the squeaky toys because I had some people disputing as to whose hand went up first, so I'm going to have to have something. Um, actually, I have a solution in here. It's... Um, it's kind of expensive, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Here it is. There's a company called EducationalInsights.com. And if, you, if you're just flush with money, like we all are these days, right, and you want to um, do your own Jeopardy game that looks exactly like Jeopardy, it's got all the music, it's got everything in it, you can get from this company a game called Classroom Jeopardy. I guess they've licensed it from the Jeopardy company. And I was trying my best to have a unit here to demo, and I just couldn't do it. I didn't give them six weeks' notice, so um, they couldn't have it. They don't usually lend out units, but um, if you go to the website, there's a contact number, and they can put you in touch with a rep who's um, close to you. You get a, um, a console that has all the software in it, and a keyboard so that you can type in your categories and your questions, and it stores um, games so you can set up different games if you teach a basic legal research and a basic um, an advanced legal research or you're teaching legal writing and you want to do a, a citation, a, a blue book quiz or an all web quiz, a citation format quiz. Actually, that's what the um, person who clued me into this was using this for. It was for a cita citation quiz. And then it displays on, on a television screen, just like the Jeopardy board. And they have, I don't have a, I didn't download the, the picture of it, but they have controllers where they can buzz in just like they do in Jeopardy and it blocks out the others so you don't have the problem of who got there first. You know exactly who got there first. Um, the unit is, the whole setup is $399. Um, and it has three, um, Team player card, name cards, three wireless student remote controllers, a host controller, a sample game cartridge, plus this console with, uh, with storage space and the, um, and the keyboard to type in yours. So that's my solution or my experience using television game shows in the classroom. And um, I'm going to turn it over now to Corinne because she has an entirely different game or two to show us. I'm going to get rid of mine. Oh. Any questions for Pam while we're transitioning here and make it seem a little bit more fluid? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Corinne. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Pam. $399. All the price information is on the website, but that's how much. No, I'm doing a different program for WWL. <laughs> I might propose it for next year, though. That's a great idea. Oh, wait. Sorry. It's hardly needed. I've been told I have the loudest voice. Okay, afternoon everyone. Again, my name is Corinne G, and uh, I am now Manager of Research Services for a law firm, um, and I would like all of you guys to think of how lucky you are to be in a law school situation where you can still make legal research fun. Unfortunately, 
Law firms have a policy of having no fun. And um, my games have been banned from, from our uh, legal research program that we have for our summer associates. We have 65 summer associates at my firm and just about as many new associates, if not more, coming in in the fall each year. And so when we teach our legal research program, it's very straightforward, talking head, uh, notebook in hand, very um, no, no laughing aloud, no fun at all. So uh, think of yourselves as having this great opportunity, again, to um, insert a little fun and a little review in your legal research courses. The first game that I'm going to talk about is uh, based off of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Uh, when I wrote this game, I was working for LexisNexis, and I was uh, traveling around working with librarians at law schools and firms and courts, etc. And I was a little nervous, being from Lexis, about the whole copyright issue. I also did not have a huge budget, so I did a parody, and I said, Who Wants to Be a Dollionaire? So to make sure that uh, the powers that be didn't think that Lexis was trying to take over. Um, uh, and again, because of my budget, obviously I didn't have a lot of money to give out. And when I wrote the game, you remember the golden dollars that, that had come out? Saskatchewan? Yeah. Sacagawea, yeah. So um, I would go out and uh, teach the game to my law school librarians or to my firm librarians, and we would all play it together. And the team that was the ultimate winner got a gold dollar. So that's why we called it Who Wants to Be a Dollionaire? And when you start to develop this game, um, you can, you don't have to make it Lexis or Westlaw or Hein Online or Legal Track or any particular database. You could have it straight legal research questions. Um, you could mix them up a little bit however you want. What's nice about this particular game is that you can easily uh, switch out the questions at any time. My game is very low tech just because of how old it is. Um, I think it's going on four years. Now, and I did it in PowerPoint. It's very easy to do, and I'll show you um, how I set up my slides. Um, but the way basically it works is there are five levels. And again, when I wrote it, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire was at the top of the game, and now I guess it's, what did you say, 15 minutes old already. I don't even know if it's still, is it still on television? Yeah. Or at least the repeats? Oh, with a different host? Okay. We just has left. <laughs> So um, there are five different levels to get up to the golden dollar, and each level is a different prize. And what you could do with your vendors is to get the uh, the Wexus folks and the Hein Online folks to uh, donate some just some little pins, little prizes um, to help you know get the students excited as they go through each level. Um, once they get to the fifth level, if they are the winners, and everyone on their team gets a golden dollar. If they um, answer incorrectly on a particular level, they get to keep the Lexis pen or the Westlaw Post-it notes or mouse pad. So they still get prizes. Um, we make it a lot of fun. I generally just write games for teams um, because I feel that if there's uh, interaction between the teacher and the students, that's great, but also interaction between the students to support each other. And they often, as um, has has been discussed here, they often get really excited if they're working in a team with their peers. If it's just one-on-one, -on -one, they feel it's more like the Socratic method and they won't talk. And they often, if you have um, a game set up for everyone to win, everyone will be very quiet. If they're in a team atmosphere, they're ready to go. All right, so basically, um, when I set up the game, I just wrote, wrote the rules um, up front because it was who wants to be a millionaire. Everyone knew how the game worked. Um, but the game was set up where you had teams. It could be like four teams in your class. And each team had to elect the leader, which would be the spokesperson, to give the final answer. There had to be consensus from the group, and one answer would be given. So they still needed to elect a leader. And that usually took about 10 minutes with the group to figure out who's going to be the leader. Um, and in their team, their team acts as their lifeline. So if you guys can remember how this game works, remember they get to call their lifeline if they don't know the, if the leader doesn't know the answer. So they could call upon people in their group to be the lifeline. And um, they could get three lifelines per question. Okay, so the leaders would be up towards the front and they could go back and ask three questions of their team. Uh, the leader gets to make the final decision on the answer, and this would often um, lead to some hilarious scenes <laughs> as the leader got to pick which is the right answer, and sometimes they were often wrong when one of their lifelines would have had the right answer. So that, was, that added a little humor as well. 
Um, and then we always got to the point, is this your final answer? So let's go through a few uh, questions. Um, for this particular game that we worked on, um, I just had Team Regis and Team Kathy Lee. And you can see how dated it is because they were, they were running their show. And level one was just a one-of-a-kind Lexus pen. Um, so if you could get through this level, they would win a Lexus pen. All right, now the first one, uh, the first type of um, questions I'm going to show you is I did the sliding in questions with the sound effects. That drives a lot of people nuts, so you'll see later on as we get through the game I took that out. This just adds a little dramatic effect. And um, this is how easy it is. Search Advisor is a key number digest tool, subject classification tool, C, citator tool, and D, news clipping tool. The student, the, the team leader would then be able to meet in, with their lifelines, uh, figure out which is the final answer. They give me their final answer. And then um, I would just uh, do a red fill on the right answer. Okay? This is so easy. It's all done by PowerPoint. Um, I couldn't have figured out how to do coding or programming if I tried four, four or five years ago. And basically, I would start from one master slide. I'd write out the question and all the answers. And each slide that you saw there was a different slide. And all I would do is just go through A and erase D, C, and B, uh, do insert, duplicate side, again from the master slide, go back and erase, and so on. And so basically, you're really only writing maybe 10 slides and then inserting duplicate sides for the rest. It's very easy to swap out questions, revise. I had to revise this uh, program because most of the stuff on Lexus had changed. So I had to totally rewrite it. Very easy to do. You could probably write this thing in an hour at most. And you can change the questions, um, again, for advanced legal research versus uh, legal research. Have, have any of you gone to trial or to a mini trial program? <coughs> I taught this to... I taught this when I was a Lexus Librarian Relations Consultant um, to our mini trial class on games on, on what you should do to, for teaching research in academic law libraries, um, games that you could use with your students. Okay, so <clears throat> we'll just go through a few points in the game. <clears throat> uh, the next, then you go over to the other side, the other team. This was Team Kathy Lee. Um, you get a whole different question again, so you get double your teaching value because you're asking one question to one group. You get to put in a new question for the next group. And again, very easy. Um, this is an automatic log. Keep searches until 2 a.m. on the next day on Lexus.com. You can retrieve these saved searches via feature called. Put in all your answers there. <coughs> Final answer, and then you just read in the, uh, the answer there. And then um, you go through the different levels until finally you get up to level five. Okay, this one was kind of funny. Case law summaries are short, concise synopsis written by attorney editors who assist users in judging relevance points in a case. Case law summaries include procedural posture, overview, and outcome of a case. Answer B is bad posture. So you can have a little bit of fun here. <clears throat> and what I think I'll do, just in the interest of time, now, you, do you guys get the hang of it here? I just went all the way to all the different levels. Let me scroll down here. And uh, this is what the golden dollar one went. I, I made the question a little bit harder than the rest. Here's a Shepard's case law signal question which was much more difficult than the others. Okay, and then once you're done, that's it. Um, and then just the end, if who wants to be a dollionaire. So it is, it is a competition between your two teams, but everyone, win pri everyone wins prizes, and um, everyone can get to the golden dollar level. So they're not excluding the others. So it's a very <clears throat> user-friendly game, and people come away with it feeling like... Uh, I got something out of it. Uh, the survivor game. Yes. About the, prizes. <coughs> the first couple of years I did this, I didn't give any prizes. It was just a repeat, strictly a repeat. And they seemed to be fine there. Last year I decided I would give prizes, and since I had been known to give them little smiley faces, I went to one of the local teaching centers and just said, Can you give me a prize? And they gave me a prize. Got something 
Yeah, when I did Who Wants to Be a Dollionaire, I was working for Lexus, and everyone has a high expectation level. What prizes are you going to bring me? What's next? So I, had, I did go big budget, um, but certainly food always works. Um, and I've taught legal research courses while I was with Lexus, but when I was, um, I would teach them at a university. And I didn't have a, a big budget. I would teach at night, and, um, and you can use candy or um, little silly prizes, stickers, anything like that. They love it. <laughs> uh, Pam was telling you, I think it was about seven years ago when um, I first used the Jeopardy game with transparencies. Um, so Jeopardy didn't even have a website then. And just to show you how simple you can make these games, I took the, um, the tape recorder that I used during law school to record courses, lectures, and I just put it up to the TV screen and tape Jeopardy. <laughs> totally illegal. And that's why I won't mention the school that I was at when I used it. Um, and I would just push the button um, during, you know, to do the opening in, in between games. So depending on, on how you feel about that. Um, now that I'm at the law firm, of course, I can't do anything quite that fun. Okay. Um, any questions on who wants to be a dollionaire? Any questions? Okay, if any of you are interested um, in getting my PowerPoint, revising it for your class, um, just send me an email. I'm at, uh, we're, we're, I was going to post it to the Cali site, just never got around to it. Here's my email address. Oh, great, okay. <laughs> They're all in there. Oh, really? That's correct. Yeah, Karen dot G. Okay, um, we can move on to Survivor, and I will do my Survivor game in a nutshell. We don't have time to, to go through all of it, but here's the main concept. Um, Survivor uh, probably being one of the most popular games for uh, law school student age types um, is a great uh, game to play, and the other reason why I like it is because it's the only game that I've thought of that can be interactive in a computer lab. All of the games that I've worked with before have been set in a classroom setting where they're sitting there and I'm projecting a question and they're answering off the top of their head or in Pam's case, have out their library research notebook. Um, but what about reinforcing um, computer, uh, computer research skills in the lab and how to do that interactively? It's a little bit more difficult. So um, with the Survivor Legal Research game, what you can do, if you can imagine, is um, you set up tribes. You're in the computer lab, and depending on how large your lab is, let's just play with four tribes. Okay, so you have these tribes. You divide up your tribes, and you can do cute names on the tribes. Like if, uh, you can call it, um, you know, tribe. You can name it after horn books, uh, tribe Prosser and Keaton, or one of the, you know, some of the uh, popular professors on campus, or the popular librarians on campus. However you want to do it, but you just call it tribe. We'll just call it Tribe X. You have four tribes. And um, it works really well in advanced legal research, usually a smaller class, because if you can limit your tribes to, say, four or five, um, what they can do is go around a single computer, sort of make a little half circle around the computer, okay? And then the, uh, the legal research professor, we will give each of the tribes an envelope. And you can use, like, parchment paper if you have the budget or make it look like those old maps that they use on Survivor. And everyone gets the same question. So you could pick um, an online database, Westlaw, Lexis, Hein Online, Legal Track, et cetera. You give them a question. And then, it, and then they have to sit down in their tribe, at their little tripod around their computer. They have to figure out the answer. The second part of the question is the delivery format. And that's how you determine who is the winner. So it could be delivery format. They have to print to the network printer. They have to print to the attached printer. They have to send an email to the librarian who has her own little um, email station open right here, and that's how you find out who the winner is. Okay, so they're working online through the question. They send out their answer. They do the print delivery. You know, they're the winner. 
And what they get is an immunity necklace that they get to wear. Here's a beautiful necklace my three-year-old made for me. This is an immunity necklace. And that, let's say Tribe X is the winner. They get to wear the beautiful immunity necklace. The rest of the tribe loses a member. And that's how you go through the game till there's no one left. And obviously, a tribe that's only two people or one person strong having to work through one of your difficult questions is not going to do as good, well, theoretically, as a, a big group of four or five. And I think what this also reinforces when you have a, a group like this is just like in a realistic law firm sets, um, scenario, once they become attorneys, uh, no one's going to be uh, the expert on Lexis Westlaw Hine online and everything, you look towards your teammates and you find out who's really Lexis oriented, who's Westlaw oriented, who really knows Hine online or Legal Track really well. They start to communicate and rely on each other to figure out the answer in the quickest way. So it's a nice team approach and it's more realistic than, you know, when you get to a law firm, you don't know everything. You know one little thing really well and that's what you stick with. So um, that is uh, surviving. You get all the way down until uh, you have just one tribe left. And that tribe is the winner. And then they get candy or, or what have you. OK? So those are my games. Now, uh, questions from all of you. Well, that's the tricky part. You have a tribe, and they have to decide who is going to be banished from their team. It's a tricky. <laughs> it's a tricky matter. I mean, some people will, you know, some of the more apathetic team members will just go, oh, yeah, I'm out of here, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> this game is so lame. I hate legal research. And they'll, they'll be banished. Um, then the diehards are going to have to, you know, maybe the person who suggested the wrong answers, you know. But you leave that to the team. And you just say, and you have amongst your team members, just like Survivor, you know, someone is going to get booted from your team. It's a hard life. It's a hard life. That's true. <laughs> I'm sorry? That's true. I mean, that's another, because they're kind of sidelined, so they could sit here and, and make fun of the, <laughs> the answers for the rest of the team. Or, Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's a downside of the game, because um, as you start to go through the game, you're going to have more and more people sidelined. Um, so I haven't thought, but if you guys can think of a solution, let me know if that, what they could be doing while the game goes on. Perhaps instead of booting the players, you could give them a time penalty where they get their questions. You keep the teams, but you say the, the people they can't rejoin. are losers get a 30-second time delay in getting their questions. Like, like hockey. Yeah. Like hockey, okay. That's a good solution. <laughs> yeah, there's another solution. You could call it the loser tribe or something. <laughs> That's a good solution. This is why this is so good. Yeah, yeah, keep everything friendly. <laughs> yes. Um, you have to write your questions to be like only like one answer. For example, um, you could write a question that could be as simple as find this ALR article. And the smart ones are going to know to go to uh, find on Westlaw and get a document on Lexis and just type in the site. And the other ones might go to ALR and do a keyword search or something to that effect. So the person answering with the only one right answer, so that's how you have to write your question. It can't be you know, vague or anything, one answer and delivering um, the fastest to you via email or to the attached printer. And what are they immune from? Um, oh, by getting uh, the boot because now their tribe is intact. Now they have immunity, so if they lose again, they give up their immunity necklace. Questions for Pam? Well, thank you very much. Y'all did a great audience. <laughs>